And so in terms of today, uh, as far as in terms of my interactions with evolutionists, evolutionary biologists, they would look to modern day Darwinism. They might call it neo-Darwinism, where they've incorporated genetics and epigenetics and, and other uh, fields and thoughts there. And so many of the lines of evidence they use, you're familiar with. I'd like to get into some of those. But you wrote on one recently, and I've got it in front of me. Looks like it was May 22nd, a couple months ago. And so your article titled, Why Don't Humans Make Their Own Vitamin C? And so a major line of evidence, the evolutionary community, the proponents of neo-Darwinism look to today, Jerry, is this argument essentially from junk DNA or pseudogenes. They'll say humans can't produce their own vitamin C and neither can the great apes because we've experienced a, a, a genetic mutation of the gulos uh, gene at some point in the past. And so we've inherited that mistake from a common ancestor with the chimpanzee. They compare those, those mistakes with the great apes. Jerry, what would be a good response or counter to that argument? Well, we find, and we know a lot about mutation. That's the work I did at the medical school because mutations are a major cause for disease. And we find there's a lot of similarity in mutations that um, among cancer, for example, invariably you have a certain mutation, which is very, very common. Well, you find that similarity in mutations is also true in different organisms because many prim the higher primates, so to speak, have genes similar to ours, and so they're going to be prone to similar mutations. In fact, it's surprised to be able to learn that we are prone to cancer. Many of the higher apes are prone to cancer, and they're prone to cancer for the same reason, the same mistakes, because the genes are similar. It's like when you break an arm, for example, or a leg, the break tends to occur in certain parts of the body. The weaker part, the arm is not equally strong from one point to the other. The humerus bone, for example, and the, uh, the other bones have weak points and therefore the breaks are more common in those areas. Well, you find the same thing is true with genes, that genes have weak points for many reasons and therefore they, they tend to break. And this, what we have with, of course, the uh, vitamin C gene is uh, probably there's a weak point that makes it more common in certain animals. But this, of course, is not evolution. This is degeneration. And uh, although it doesn't hurt us because most of us get a, a good diet in fruit, although it did in the sailors when they went on trips in the boats and didn't have some uh, citrus fruits with them, some limes or lemons or uh, other fruits that have vitamin C. So it did hurt some people, but most people throughout the Western world had plenty of fruits that they ingested, so therefore they weren't even aware of this problem because it didn't occur among them. So there's a lot of reasons for that similarity, but I don't remember if I talked about the exceptions, but there are some primates that don't have the problem, some that do have the problem, which you would not expect. <clears throat> I think those are some excellent points. For the audience sake, especially, I'd like to screen share your article here jerry okay. why don't humans make their own vitamin c <clears throat> i think it's an important topic i think i'll make a clip of this section too because many militant or adamant proponents of common descent continue to look to this one and so you pointed out a number of things there but if we share similar genes with other creatures let's say the primates or even chimpanzees specifically those similar genes are going to be more prone simply due to environmental factors and other reasons as well, to the same breakages. And now, would that be due to mutational hotspots? I know that you talk about uh, hotspots in this article as well. Is that essentially yeah, it what would it be? Yeah, it would. that's be one reason. Also, I found the data is somewhat incomplete, and there are a lot of animals they didn't look at. And so I couldn't come to any conclusion that is firm as I would like, because we need to do analysis of all primates and, and many right. organisms that are similar to us, like some of the more similar, similar organisms to us are pigs. That's why we use the valves from pigs, or used to at least. Uh, guinea pigs, ironically, are immunologically similar to us. Rats are in many ways immunologically similar to us. And so we need to do a more detailed examination across the uh, animal kind to make more definitive conclusions. But in evolution, there's no motive to do this. So I was surprised actually to come up with the articles I did. 
Yeah, because here in terms of anomalies, which the evolutionary community typically likes to ignore or not talk about as much, you say, but the bat and guinea pig violate the expected pattern, the pattern here when it comes to primates. Is that right? Right. And there are probably others, but those are ones that I have the data on. Now, and I, and I like your point about the uh, breaking a bone, whether it's your arm bone or your leg bone, which I have experience with. Uh, the, the people, when they break a certain bone, let's say in their arm, they're breaking it in, in uh, very specific spots. A lot of the same spots are more prone to that kind of injury in the same way that a lot of these genes are prone to similar breakages. And so I'm wondering, do you think, Dr. Bergman, that humans, since we get a lot of vitamin C from our diet and we were created in a garden, which I'm assuming had a lot of fruits, vegetables, and vitamin C. Do you think our gene there, the Gulo gene, the original function was vitamin C production, or do you think it might have had a different function? Well, I think it probably was vitamin C production. And uh, okay. there are some areas where evolution is, in a sense, true, and that would be <laughs> if we have a mutation which causes a problem, that mutation may be more apt to be selected out. If we have mutations, which we do, that don't cause a problem, or at least don't cause a problem in reproduction, it's going to become more common. It's a result of Genesis fall, of course. We have certain mutations which are much more common than others. Male pattern baldness, I guess, is a good example. Color blindness is a good example. Where these mutations don't generally affect our life expectancy or ability to reproduce. And so, therefore, they uh, a lot of male pattern baldness is common. And a lot of males are, as I am, colorblind. And so... Uh, that is yeah, I think that's I think that's a good response. And so since, as you pointed out, we get vitamin C from. So even though we can't synthesize our own vitamin C, we get a lot of vitamin C from our diet. Just naturally, we also take vitamin C supplements and that would be similar to, let's say, a lot of your primates they are getting vitamin C from their diet. So is that one of the reasons that makes this gene more prone to breaking is because natural selection isn't really going to preserve the gene? since we're getting vitamin C from so many outside sources, we don't really need, it's, it's not essential to have a gene to produce that which we're getting externally. Right, it's just not as critical. If other genes broke that affected our life expectancy, then of course those would be selected out. And so natural selection has one function and that is it reduces degeneration. Right. It doesn't cause us to go upward, it just reduces going downward. And so that this is a good example of where natural selection, uh, in this case, doesn't have a negative effect because it doesn't, uh, in this case, uh, cause it to go downward. Right. Selection is just a fine-tuning mechanism, keeps a species as strong as it can be. Right. And so these critical, these genes that are not critical to life, they're going to be more prone to damage. And selection, it's not adding anything new. It's not taking species uphill, like you've said. And so it doesn't necessarily need to preserve a gene like like a vitamin C producing gene. So I'm wondering, we know a lot of so-called pseudogenes. Dr. Bergman, I know you've written on this. You've talked about this. A lot of pseudogenes we've discovered aren't really broken genes. They're necessary to sustain healthy life processes. And in many so-called pseudogenes, the expression of that gene helps to regulate the translation of its protein coding counterpart. And so they're working together which I find is, is very interesting. And so how can we determine what is a real broken gene, like what seems to be the case with the Gulo pseudogene, and a gene that the evolutionary community simply says is broken, but really isn't broken. It it's, it's, has a design function. Takes a lot of gene sequencing, which is what I used to do. Takes, and now it's a lot easier. I did a lot of this by hand, which is, I think of it as kind of primitive how I did it, but it was good that I did it that way because I understood what we were doing. And now we don't do much of it by hand. It's done by machines. And therefore, I can see that people have a hard time understanding what the machine is doing. Or I understand what it's doing because I did that by hand. So therefore, each step that we took, I knew why we did it and what we were trying to do. And so there's an advantage of learning it the way I did. But now, of course, it's, oh, you can sequence genomes just like crazy. And they, of course, they are doing huge amount of sequencing when you can sequence the entire well it took what 
three years to, to sequence the human genome. Now you can do it in three hours. And so uh, That's amazing. as we have more and more sequencing, we're able to do more and more of these comparisons and determine more and more specifically what genes cause the problem and what genes are mutated because be passed on and not cause a problem. Therefore, they're not selected against. Therefore, they are, can be common in our, our, our population. That's a great answer. I think we're just in the infancy of understanding fully the DNA language. And the more our sequencing capabilities uh, become more sophisticated, the more we learn really about the DNA, the more functional we find it to be. Would it be accurate, Jerry, to say that there's two different starting points with the creatious like ourselves and the evolutionist when it comes to DNA variation? As a creatious, would we say that the majority of DNA variation is due to design, design diversity. It's the evolutionist that explains all DNA differences and DNA variation as being the result of mutations. So they're looking at all DNA variation as mutations, whereas a creationist, we're working to determine what is a mutation and what's a design difference. Uh, yeah, that's a good, that's a good illustration that uh, we're looking at perfection lost they're looking at perfection gained. Mm, yeah. So they're looking at the opposite of what we are. They're looking at natural selection will perfect the genome. We're looking at a perfect genome, which has lost that perfection due to the fall. That's great. Yeah. It's a, a genome that's essentially going downhill. <clears throat> so here's a critic in the chat. We like to leave no stone unturned. And we appreciate our critics here, our proponents of evolution. And so Andrew Cumming, he... This is his argument or response. He says mutational hotspots. He's basically arguing mutational hotspots is insufficient because they don't explain similar pseudogenes with similar mutations. So I think he's pointing to so-called mutations within the pseudogene. So maybe mutations within the GULO gene. Hotspots lead to higher frequency of mutations, not specific mutations. In your opinion, what would be a good... Well, hotspots leads to a mutation in a specific area of the genome. And that's what we did when they were doing research on cancer. You find that certain, for example, a P53, which is the one I work with, very, yeah. very important system. And there were like four places that 90-some percent of all the mutations occurred. And therefore, when you have a cancer patient, high percent of the time, you have a mutation in one of these four places. And so we're talking about specific places in the genome, in this case, P53. And most cancers, you have hot spots, and that's what you're looking for. And then you have cold spots, which, of course, rarely occur. And so I guess I don't quite follow what, of course, my work is cancer and trying to understand the cause of cancer and so on. But pseudogenes, I don't know much about how that relates to pseudogenes. I, but I would guess pseudogenes would have hot spots and therefore would cause the, the gene not to work. And therefore we call it a pseudogene, which is a term I don't like. Pseudogenes, right. false gene, they're not looking at false genes, they're looking at genes that, that are not functional, non-functional. And they could be non-functional because of hotspots. So, and in cancer research, that's a key of understanding where the, the change occurs and why. <clears throat> right. And, and Go ahead. Well, I was going to point out in your article here, which I've got on the screen again, you show the mutation pattern or spectrum. And when you consider everything, you point out, note the loss of the ability to synthesize vitamin C appears to be random and not due to inheritance from an evolutionary ancestor. I've read papers, one that specifically comes to mind, where they show the independent breaking or acquisition of these mutations in many different creatures that is not related to ancestry. So just because we may have the same DNA break as another creature does not necessitate that we inherited that from a common ancestor with that creature. Is that right, Jerry? Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and again, I wish we had more data, but we had enough data where I think my conclusions will hold even when we do more sequencing, but it's not a, a leading area in genetics to research the damaged gene that produces vitamin C. So a lot more important, of course, are cancer it's genes that, are cause, that cause cancer. And there's so many diseases that are mutational caused. Therefore, that, that has to be the focus and is the focus. But in doing that, we can pick up a lot of other information 
like, for example, this claims relative to inheritance? That's a great answer. I appreciate that, Jerry. I think that puts that argument to bed. We also need further research and data or else, especially with the evolutionists, they'd be premature to make the conclusions that that they make. And so we'll uh, turn that into a clip so people have a go-to video on the Gulo pseudogene. So Jerry, I appreciate that and your work on that topic.